the edition of the Linux install.net podcast. Take two. <laughs> try again. <laughs> Let's try it one more time. Hello and welcome to another... Uh, I still can't get it out. Hello and welcome to another edition of the LinuxInstall.net podcast. This is Joe Luzzi taking over Brian Wagner because he cannot talk tonight. <laughs> You've been voted off, sir. <laughs> I've been voted you off. You are my voted own off the podcast. <laughs> Goodbye, sir. Hey, have a good night with your new Linux box. You cannot learn, run. run. <laughs> yes, thank you. Can't talk either. <laughs> <laughs> Brian, so go you guys can see I have a uh, new camera. And a new machine, and I'm Brian. Wagner. It doesn't work. <laughs> it's still got some kinks. We're working on it. Uh, you already heard from Joe. The other voice out there is Mr. Greg Martin. Hello, Webs. And last but not least, our special guest, Mr. Mike Jensen. Hi, Mike. Greetings. All right. So, uh, yeah. thanks, Mike. We'll see you later. <laughs> <laughs> Craig's a little salty because he's no longer the new guy. <laughs> um, I'm jealous. It was a great, was a great episode, guys. I'm going to go play a game now or something. I'm your token <laughs> Windows developer. There you go. You know. All right. Hang on now. Greg just said he's run. Greg just said he's running Windows 8. You're a Windows developer. This yeah. Linux install people. I I you told you I'm blaspheming me. tonight. I, you know. I'm just surprised. I work with all Windows geeks, and every one of them is put on and now take off Windows 8. <laughs> <laughs> They've all gone. Forget it. I can't handle Metro. <laughs> Yeah, I think we need to talk about that because, like, my girlfriend loves Windows 8, actually, which is really shocking. Like, Can she figure out how to get to Charms? Yeah. Well, what is she, she, I guess, what, is she, what does she like about it? Uh, well, the thing is, is like, she's an, a really big Hotmail user, right? So, I mean, like, the automatic Hotmail integration is... Yeah. Is just for her. It's seamless. Like she just signs on her emails on the you know from the start uh, start screen. Everything's there for, her, you know. Um, and everything everything live updates, which is another kind of neat thing. Yeah, I mean, exactly. With the, well, yeah, yeah. And, and realistically, look, I want to I want to clear something up. That start screen, you can completely bypass that in the same way that you can bypass the dash and the gnome the gnome shell by hitting the super key. You can get rid of that damn thing completely, mm -hmm. basically. I mean, you can get around that all the time, and that's what I do. Um, but it is for power users. It's, I feel it's very restrictive, though. Like I can, I, I cannot go as fast as I normally do when I'm on my uh, Fedora or Ubuntu box. I just, I well, if you don't do the start screen, how do you do? What do you do for a start menu? Uh, the funny thing is, is I actually have a terminal window open all the time, and I'm launching programs from that. That's <laughs> okay, so you're the... cheating, and you're using Windows knowledge -ish stuff to work in Windows? See, yeah, see, you know, it, uh, it helps to know command line. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, so for everybody out there who says terminal's dead, piss off, because it's not. Windows 8 is bringing it back, is that what you're trying to say? Yeah, Windows 8 is making the terminal real, baby. That's what I'm talking about. <laughs> <laughs> wow. That's what do I look have, forward do you, to. Do you have the text green in your terminal window? Uh, actually, it's blue. So. Oh, so you need to make it green like an old green screen. Uh, there you I, go. I, can't, I, can't do the, I can't do the green on black, man. That hurts my eyes after a while. Um, Can you imagine there was a time when everybody had to look at green on black? Yeah. Or Actually, Joe lovely, still does. He has that wonderful that, uh, AS400 screen to look at. Shut it. Yeah. <laughs> yes, yes, I do. Are you saying that's a bad thing if you have your... <laughs> <laughs> CDC, Dell... <laughs> So I, are there are there what do you like do you like anything about Windows 8? Let's start there. Uh, okay, so the, uh, there are a couple things I do like about it. Uh, first of all, the 
the UI is really, really nice, actually. And that might sound like a really dumb thing to say, but they cleaned it up a lot. And not having aero glass really speeds the system up. It's not eating up as much RAM for the UI, I can tell you that. Um, in general, performance is up, too. Uh, you know, file read writes, especially if you're using, I mean, clearly I'm using SSD, so I've got to jump there, but just, it's fat. I've just noticed that it's actually using as much throughput as it can on that SSD rather than Windows 7 where it kind of feels throttled a little bit. Um, so basically just, uh, those are really the only two things I like is just the, the general performance overhaul and the UI overhaul for the general desktop are really nice. Uh, you know, a couple of the things you said about, like, jumping right to the desktop and everything, Maximum PC actually threw up an article today where they had, like, I um, eight tips or so for Windows 8, a um, mm -hmm. couple registry hacks and everything um, on how to get past, uh, you know, the start screen and everything like that. There were some pretty good tips that they had. I was glancing at them earlier today. Yeah, I haven't seen that. You had to send me the link or something like that. But, uh, I mean, like I said, usually what I've been doing is just hitting the super key, you know, because when you sign in, it goes straight to the start screen. And so I just hit the super key and get rid of it, and that's it. Um, realistically, though, like I said, I I can't use this for work. It's it's not. I mean, this is very much still a gaming setup, but I I can't work under these under this system. Cool. Yeah, see, and that's mm -hmm. the thing that the the guys were saying. They're like, I, I can't get to hardly anything. They're trying to figure out. Well, I installed SQL Server so that I can do the software that they support, and they're like, but how do I get to the SQL Server Manager tool? Yeah. I mean, I can appreciate what Microsoft's trying to do here, and I haven't, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll throw this out up front. I haven't used Windows 8 on, on a uh, tablet or touch-enabled device yet, um, which I'm sure would probably do pretty well if you could configure the system to be entirely Metro. But, you know, if, you've, if you're trying to do both Metro and desktop or just desktop, I don't think it's going to work on a tablet device very well. You don't think it's going to work on a tablet device? Not, not a pure desktop. No, like if you're trying to set it up as like a pure desktop experience like you have from previous versions of Windows, I don't think it's going to work out really well for you. I mean, if you get, if you get uh, a Surface and try to use it like that, you, you've got the wrong device. That's not going to work like that. Now, from what I saw, Leo Laporte using, when he had the Surface over the weekend, um, he had the Surface RT, he was, he, he seemed to actually really like it. He said yeah. that, that, whole, that that whole Windows interface flowed really nice. Um, he said they actually had a key where you can hop back and forth between the desktop and, like, that start menu and everything, yeah. um, I think it was. So it was, it looked really sharp. But I definitely yeah. would not go RT. Oh no, no. Like I said, if I mean, if like I was saying, if your goal is a, is a standard desktop experience, then RT and Surface is not, you know, is not the way to go. But it, yeah. it's weird how it's weird how that works out because when you have Windows 8 on your desktop, you basically are stuck between two different paradigms, right? You're stuck in this weird spot where you're saying, okay, well, I have the ability to run a standard desktop, but I'm kind of being forced into at least doing something with this Metro crap, and. Yeah. But then you start to realize the more you spend time with it, it's two very different configurations. Like if if you want a standard desktop experience, you don't want the Metro. But if you want the Metro, you don't want the desktop. Mm -hmm. And you don't know which way to go with it, basically. Right. And what he was basically saying about the RT was he said to him with the keyboard and everything attached to it, he goes, it's more of almost like an Ultrabook, almost yeah. like a laptop than a true tablet. Mm. You know, is what is what is is the feeling he was getting from it, and I was like, I go, yeah, I can kind of see that, you know, with yeah. the keyboard there and everything. It does it 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 looks almost and probably feels just like a laptop. So, what did what, did we lose, Mike? I think we lost Mike, and we gained Corey. <laughs> Hi, Corey. Hi. Hi. <laughs> Corey kicked Mike out. That's what happened. <laughs> <laughs> it's like there's too many people in here. See you later. We can have nine. <laughs> Brian, did you not pay the Hangout bill? Yeah. <laughs> I paid for Hangout. I'm just the only fool paying for Hangout, but I paid for it. Sure. The, the Google tax. Mike's trying to get back in, but um, that's okay. We'll just hold off on 
I have questions for Mike because Mike was doing some stuff, but um, we should probably talk about Linux stuff since this. Is yeah, it's, it's yeah. stop. It's stop being. Stop being, you know, bad people and talking about, you know, freedom hating crap. Yeah, every, everybody's already probably turned us off now. <laughs> <laughs> well, probably. But that was as well. soon as they saw you. It really wasn't anything. To do really? With the topic. Really? Really? Oh yeah. Hey, we're, we're just gonna trying go to there. be. We're, we're just trying to be a fair and unbiased show here. Uh, <laughs> you know, so don't shoot me. Don't shoot us. Don't send your hate mail. But if you want to, you know. Podcast send it to Brian. Yeah, send it to Brian. <laughs> yeah, make, exactly. sure, make sure it's CC'd and forwarded to Brian and nobody else. Yeah, go. Brian Brian is the founder here, so I mean, just, <laughs> look, just look at his lower third. He's, yeah. he's allowing this content. <laughs> I'll edit it out of the podcast. <laughs> <laughs> and Joe, I have so much audio on you, I could make you say anything. Yeah, you probably could. <laughs> you probably could. Mike, what happened, man? Not sure. Uh, something with was my that, internet. Could could was, happen to, be, to do with the halo in the other room. Oh. Was that terminal window? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Windows fighting back because he was using a terminal. <laughs> All right. So uh, Corey Silver joined us while you were away, Mike. Okay. Hey, Corey. Hi. All right, Corey. So we've had this thing on the rundown for uh, two episodes now that. Um, is uh, Corey is installing something to check it out, but I don't know what. So I've forgotten at this point. What were you using? Um, well, I actually just um, installed Ubuntu Studio on one of my desktops because I wanted to try out the 64-bit version uh, on an old PC I had laying around. And I was telling Joe uh, at work that I've had nothing but issues with it as far as wireless drivers. Everything else has been beautiful. absolutely love it. But when it comes to getting the Broadcom driver, I uh, just cannot get it to load. I've looked at just about every forum I think I can comb through, and no dice. <laughs> um, that's because Broadcom is notoriously bad. <laughs> well, <laughs> right up there with NVIDIA. Like, you know, Linus a few episodes ago we were talking about was flipping off NVIDIA and telling them to go screw themselves. Um, he would probably say the same thing about Broadcom. They have been just as bad about supporting and being forthcoming with what's going on with their devices. Some of them have awesome support. I've had no problems with them. Other cards, can't get them to work to save your life. Yeah, well, that's what I'm running into, and I've been uh, persistent with it, but... Is your wired card, is the wired part of the laptop working? I'm assuming it's a laptop. It's a desktop. Oh, it's a desktop? Yeah. Does the wired connection work? Oh, yeah, both of them. Hmm. You know what's sad is I think MTP support is better than Broadcom's driver support. <laughs> <laughs> and I fight with MTP on a daily basis, so there you go. See, and conversely, I plugged in this beautiful new camera that I have from Logitech, and it worked right out of the box. First time plugged in, no additional drivers. I, I think, well, actually, I think there's... I think there's a kernel module specifically for Logitech cameras, actually. Yeah, I'm pretty sure there is. Because the same camera technology is used by not just Logitech. There's a couple of different companies that are using the same optics and uh, the camera itself. Yeah. So since we talked about Windows there for a little bit and Corey wasn't here for that conversation, let's actually, since we're doing Linux now, Corey, what do you like and what don't you like besides the... The wireless not working on your on your on your desktop, obviously. But what do you like and not like about the OS so far oh, that you're running? I love everything else about it. Um, it's very clean. Um, it's simple. It's back to the normal, you know, menu structure. Um, of course, it being Ubuntu Studio, it comes with a lot of extras. Um, of course, I still had to do the normal stuff like LibreOffice and uh, VLC and a few others. But other than that, out of the box, it was nice. Just it was mainly the wireless that I had an issue with. So have you played around with um, what else on there? Audacity and the video editing stuff or any of that? Um, I've used those before, but not on this particular uh, install just because I've spent most of my time troubleshooting the driver issue. I knew you know, about the other software that was on it, so I haven't had to play around with that too much. But Cool. Yeah. 
So the other one that you were talking about was Zorin OS 6. You were playing with that before. Yeah, I had downloaded the light <laughs> version, um, but I cannot get my laptop to read the disk yet. So <laughs> that's another bust right now. So we're having trouble figuring out how to write a bootable disk? No, 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 no. It's a, it's a bootable disk. It's just the, the, the laptop won't play nice. Blame uh, HPA for that. That's all his fault. So, so I guess we can't have you compare and contrast them. No, um, I'll have it for next time, I promise. Uh-huh. <laughs> so, uh, let's see. Well, we kind of talked about my new machine. I basically set up a new Core i7 box for here at home, had some spare memory laying around. So I've got about 8 gigs of memory in it. Um, Wait, that was your spare memory? It was just 8 gigs, you know, just... <laughs> I actually had 12, but I had around. four slots. Oh. <laughs> yeah, because I had a server, and I upgraded the server last spring from 12 to 24 gig. So so I had 12 gigs laying around, so I didn't have to buy memory. But it came with a four gig, a single 4 gig DIMM, which I decided not to use because I figured it was going to hurt performance. And I like fast. And as we were talking about before the show, there uh, I also got an SSD... At Joe's recommendation, I got a Samsung 830, which is beautiful, especially since my motherboard does support SATA 3, so it's super fast. I like clicking, and things are there. There's no thinking. What's your boot time? There. Uh, the boot time is, I haven't really timed it. It's, it can't be much more than five, six, seven seconds. Oh, it takes nice. it longer to go through the posting than it does to actually do it. Jeez. That's awesome. It's a sad day that's when awesome. your motherboard's the bottleneck. <laughs> yeah. it, seriously, from pushing it on till it's booted, it is literally the motherboard that's the problem. Yeah, that's my problem too, actually. It's so, it, it's like, it's just there. Well, that and plus all the stuff with, because um, I'm running Ping Guy again. Um, I played around with a couple others. I debated doing the straight Linux Mint, the Debian one that I'm actually running on my son's computer, but decided I wanted something with some more stuff pre-installed so I didn't have to spend too much time installing stuff. Um, and other than having to fight with some Python libraries that I couldn't figure out how to get working in stuff, I haven't had any real issues. And the Python stuff was my fault, not the systems. So, But uh, I like it. It's very fast. It's very nice. Very, very nice. So, and very cheap, actually. Because I only spent, to in total, I've only got 650 bucks into the system, so it's not like I spent a fortune. Everybody's so talkative now when I'm talking. We, we are listening. Just, we, I am on the edge of my seat. Look at this, edge of my seat. <laughs> <laughs> Better watch it. The dog's going to come push it out from underneath you. So. You know, when, when the founder starts talking, we all start <laughs> listening. <laughs> exactly. exactly. Since when does that happen? Uh, <laughs> since now. That's what yeah, it's Since now, happen. okay. <laughs> Enjoy right. these five minutes because it's not happening again. <laughs> that's, that's probably true. <laughs> All right. So, um, anybody else have anything exciting going on? Well, I was just wondering I, if anyone can identify the Disney character in the background of my video. Oh, come on. Oh, man. Oh, come on. <laughs> that's awesome. <laughs> oh, wait, wrong one. <laughs> <laughs> I just heard yeah. right before right before I came upstairs, the four billion that um, he was paid, he's actually donating to charity. Oh, really? Yeah. <laughs> it's not like he needs money. He's made so and much money. He's, the he's, I guess he's. I guess he's very much into the educational um, arena as far as um, for donations and stuff like that, and he's going to give um, all of it, I guess, to an educational charity. Wait, that means he's even cashing out what he got in stocks and giving that too, or is he keeping that? Why well, I, I think I I don't know. It, they just said like he was donating the four billion is what they mm -hmm. said. So yeah, because he didn't get four billion cash. He got a half in stock and half in cash. I think is what he got. So well, he's probably doing like Bill and Melinda Gates did and donating it to a foundation so that he can 
dole it out without having to pay. It's it's yeah. And he's in it. Dodge. It's just so he doesn't have to pay the taxes on it. He can just donate as much as possible. Um, <coughs> I was surprised he was going to let him put out more Star Wars movies. That's what shocked me. Oh, that didn't surprise me any. Once Disney got their grubby little fingers on that, oh. you knew five more of those were coming. Well, I was going to say, well, once he sold it, he can't say yes or no to that stuff. That's he I know, signed but I mean, all that's over. why I was surprised. That, that's why I was surprised that he was willing to sell it. He could have sold the technology without selling Star Wars. He True. Could have sold Lucas Arts without selling the Star Wars franchise. Well, I don't know if it would have been worth four billion, but although you know, THX has got some royalties coming in, I'm sure. Plus yeah, all just a couple. Stuff. Just a few, one or two here or there. Nothing, nothing big. <laughs> nothing that wouldn't keep them fat for their, you know, next twenty or thirty years. Well, and now Disney owns all of LucasArts instead of just Pixar. Yeah. So Go Disney. Lucas. Yes. So we're gonna see, we're gonna see a video game where Mickey Mouse, Spider Man, and Luke Skywalker are fighting each other because they own Marvel too. Yeah. Yeah, I was surprised when so I heard we got, what all. I was surprised when I heard what all Disney owned. I was like, "You kidding me?" Yeah, I remember hearing that years ago, but it never really sunk in until just right now. I was like, "Well, oh my gosh!" I'm like, that, "Yeah, they could have some hell of a crossover here." No kidding, <laughs> man. Like, you know, they have like Super Smash Brothers Brawl. They could have like exactly. Disney, like yep. Disney Brawl with you know all their properties. Everybody just gets together and yeah. Sony's putting Sony's putting out a game like that. Yeah, I saw where that. They, like, they, was it yeah, like PlayStation they, All-Stars or something? Yeah, yeah, where they're they're doing like all their top name, you know, characters and everything are doing like a brawl type game, which is just like the Nintendo one. Yep. Hmm. Wow. Got weird audio coming in. Anyway, yeah, Corey was muffled. I was gonna say, was somebody was talking there? Talking? Corey, were you saying something? I was, but I wasn't listening. Wow, we I, think can't he, hear you. I think he muted himself. No. There you go. That's better. Whatever, whatever you did, you just undid it. Oh, that's good. <laughs> no, I was gonna say Control what's Mickey. <laughs> I was gonna say what's Mickey's power? Is he gonna throw a mousetrap at you? Steamboat know. Willie, man, that's his plan to fame. Are we driving the Millennium Falcon? Is that what you're saying? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> the first, that whole movie's replaced. Like Mickey takes over Luke's role in that movie. <laughs> So, so has anybody else kicked into a Kickstarter project? I have never once paid for one. I've thought about it a lot of times, but I haven't done it yet. I have, yeah. and I got my first T-shirt from Kickstarter. Ooh. Sweet. What what project did you kick to? I kicked to Steve Jackson Games, the ogre game that they had. Um, I threw in twenty five bucks. Basically, um, once they reached the goal. They started saying if you hit one of the additional goals, they would then start working on Car Wars next year's. And growing up, I always liked Car Wars, so for twenty-five bucks, I got a T-shirt saying that I made Steve Jackson work on Car Wars. <laughs> and um, when they do start working on it next year, I will get um, early access into the forums to have input into the game and everything like that, and some of the rules. Nice. So I thought that was for twenty five bucks. I was like, I told my wife, I was like, I'm I'm kicking twenty five bucks into this. So she was like, Go ahead. She goes, You and your damn T shirts. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So shall we start talking about stories? Does anybody else have anything yes. they want to discuss of what we've done for the week, or are we going story time? Because we've already probably been gabbing for a while, um, for a while now. Yes. Uh, you know what? Let's actually be professionals here, John. Let's, let's let's get stuff done. <laughs> I'm sorry, who was that talking? <laughs> that was not the founder talking. Uh, you know, that was that was just some some peon trying to throw some direction up towards the founder. Oh. But uh, I see. Anyways, because <laughs> I was the one rambling about Windows 8 for the first ten minutes. Hey, you but, know what? <laughs> I'm let's trying get to be... talking. Let's talk about Sandy. Good old Sandy. Yeah, Sandy. Sandy's real good broad. Yeah. She was quite destructive. She took out quite a few data centers in New York City. Yep. We have actually two different stories about this. Because 
I am. Uh, <clears throat> we are hosted by one of the fools who actually had their servers stored in a data center in a flood zone in uh, New York City. I don't know who planned this idea, and I really think it's as much as I would like to blame Squarespace and the others that are <clears throat> hosting with them. The company that did the hosting should have been smart enough not to put their servers in a flood zone. I mean, that was. I would have thought that would have been something they would have looked at before they spent millions or a billion dollars on putting a data center in New York City. But. Well. Um, yeah. <laughs> well, what? But. Yeah. I thought you were going to say something there. It sounded like you cut off. Oh. No, I mean, I just, I saw a bunch of people talking about it, oh, poor them, poor them, and I just, I got really irritated with it. I was like, no, not poor them. They well, no, I mean, I mean, you know, that's like, them. that's like those idiots putting nuclear reactors on the edge, by the ocean, you know? It's like, yeah, you, you, you dam them up, but eventually it's going to break and it's going to get flooded. Why the hell put it there? Then for most corporations, they're not going to, it's like security, they're not going to, think about that and the cost you know they don't, they're not going to think about it that deeply you know I mean that's just I mean, the reality until they get bit now well, yeah but I, thinking I, about it. I don't know I, I guess it's me but I guess I didn't think that was too deep of thought frankly I thought that was like common sense I mean here's the land here's the ocean don't put shit there but <laughs> <laughs> I didn't realize that that was hard for security people like you know there's a body of water here. I mean, it's kind of hard to miss. Well, and but. the thing is, too, is so the, the ZDNet article that I put a link to and I'll have in the show notes, the, the ZDNet article says that, that Datagram put their stuff in zone A. So they're, like, they can probably go to the top of their building and see the river or whatever the bay, whatever they're facing there. I don't know New York City well enough to know what that is. But they can see the water from where they're at. It's not like they oh, maybe the water's there. No, it's there. And it was probably... The other thing was, I was surprised that it was that close to the water, because you would have thought that would have driven the price of the property up. But no kidding. One of, the, one of the things that I had never realized before, when one of the places I used to work, um, we used a SunGuard facility, um, which I think was down 77, um, close to Akron, uh, for our disaster recovery. And I had never realized this, but after Brian put up that map and I started reading some of these articles, I kind of thought about that facility, and it's at the top of a hill down there. Mm -hmm. So if that place had ever flooded, it was pretty much probably the end of the world it, because it, because everything would so far below it. If the water got up that high to be able to flood that building, it was you, you're pretty much just the, at the apocalypse, I would say. <laughs> and I'm sure that they probably had thought about that for, you know, to have the recovery site up there. But I, years ago when we were going there, I had never really thought about it, you know, why why this thing was up at the top of the hill. Yeah. But you went to the uh, IBM facility just outside of New York City, right? I can't remember what those town was yes. called. Yes. Yeah. Well, that was in and, New Jersey, wasn't it? Well, yeah. It's New Jersey, New York. It's right on the border. I mean, yeah, I know, yeah, it's right on the border. I know yeah. that certain crews managed to finish early enough and were allowed to take day trips into New York City when they finished DR early. So it wasn't that far away. Um, but that was also at the top of a hill, at the top of a very high hill. <laughs> I mean, if that had flooded, I would have been seriously concerned. Yeah. So. Um, I mean, it's not to downplay the fact that the flooding is, uh, you know, it's a, it's, a, it's a bad thing all around. I mean, regardless of whether or not you plan to put your data center right by the ocean, you know, it's a bad thing. But, well, uh, I mean, yeah. You know, but still, it's kind I mean, of critical infrastructure. You, you kind of want to put a little bit more thought into where you put that crap. I mean, you don't want it near a volcano. You don't want it near ocean, you know. But I mean, even if you are going to put your, if you're, okay, forget the hosting company, because they're going to put them wherever they can do it cheaply. I get that. Well, yeah. And if they lost one data center, it shouldn't really put them out of business. Probably won't put them out of business. Because um, I'm sure Datagram has multiple data centers all over the country. But the companies like Huffington Post, Gawker, BuzzFeed, whose only data center was this one in New York City, should have at least done geographic 
diversity. They should have at least had them split into different areas. Yeah. I just I don't understand who plans a site as big <clears throat> as the Huffington Post or Gawker and then says, oh, maybe we shouldn't use more than one data center. That well, maybe- Datagram probably told them we have 99.9% uptime. And it usually starts, like most projects and most corporate things, it starts off as something small, you know, that wasn't, didn't have the thought put into it, and then suddenly it gains a lot of traction, and then suddenly you've got too much momentum, and people aren't, most of the time, aren't willing to stop the momentum in order to take care of often critical (laughs) uh, critical things. Oh, yeah, yeah, that's... You know, you, you you like you said, you start rolling, and then before long, you you, know, you got so much stuff going on, you can't even go back and fix the bricks. No, yep. and then so. stuff like this happens, and people go. Uh, I mean, it's like it's like in software development, somebody puts a great prototype together, everybody everybody sees it, and everybody buys on board, and all the developers are going, you know, this is a prototype. Um, if we're going to use this in production, we got to rewrite it from scratch. And everyone's like, yeah, 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 we'll do that. And then they sell it to everybody. Suddenly you have 10,000 people live on it, and it's still the prototype. And you're going, um, you know, that's not going to hold more than maybe 10,004 people before it starts <laughs> crashing. <laughs> but but there's too much investment and too much momentum. And and that's the way companies make decisions. It, it, it It's not right, and it's and – it's... Right, but, okay, at the same time, all of well, at least Huffington Post, I know did. I'm sure Gawker did. BuzzFeed have all reported on Amazon's issues and the other companies that got hit because they only had stuff in one data center. So I, I agree that that it's that way initially, but these are websites. This isn't this isn't a standalone application. I guess the the one thing that would be tricky would be doing their commenting systems. That mm-hmm. would be a little more difficult because of replication of data. Um, but I don't know. That's why they should just put everything in a Git repo and sync it all, you know. <laughs> well, I was I was posting on somebody else's comment about this. He was like, oh, I feel so bad for the companies and blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, I don't feel bad for the companies. I feel bad for all the people in the area. Don't get me wrong. I think that was not that anybody, it was anybody's fault or hey, hey, Brian. Much to the conspiracy theories idea. It's Brian. not that anybody planned that damage. Brian, but. Brian companies are people too. I forgot. <laughs> I forgot. I just I should have listened to Mitt. I I'm we, sorry. We... Um sorry. But, <laughs> that's okay. Um but I mean the devastation of this is and, and I don't think we've seen the end of, of the devastation of Sandy and I think there's other critical parts of the internet that are in New York City besides Datagram's data center. And I'm oh, really yeah. curious to see what else gets affected because while MA East is down around DC, and that's why Amazon's data center is in that DC, Virginia area, is because they're right next to the Eastern Hub for the US. There's another large hub in New York City. And I don't, it, I'm hoping, and it sounds like, and since there's nobody's talking about it, it must be in a higher ground situation. It, it's still in New York City, but it might be in a higher ground area. It was the lower areas that got really affected. And still, nothing compares to. Just the sheer devastation I've seen out of the pictures out of New Jersey, just it got wiped. I mean, com- by comparison. I wonder um, how those guys at Linode are doing out there. Yeah. So, all right, enough complaining about them. Let's go to my next cool story that I found. Oh, wait. Check. He's lost it. Yeah, no, actually, I was going to, I'm going to wait. I'm going to switch the. I'm going to go with the order that I actually have these in. The next thing is to talk about uh, the reason why we have our special guest. Even though Corey's not following the color pattern, I just realized. But anyways, the next... No, well, neither is Mike. I mean, what, what is this here? Well, we we Mike have no was the consistency. Special guest. Mike was the special guest. He got green. Corey was the one not following the standard for Linux install members and sticking with red. So anyways. Ooh. So... <laughs> That's that's so, that's the color for being that's the color for being late. Yes, <laughs> that's, yes. That's the color for being I late. had to identify myself. <laughs> so, Mr. Jansen is actually using EC2 in his day job and wrote a um, 
I mean, not tremendously detailed, but a, a quick synopsis of, of their use of it. And I asked him on so that we could uh, quiz him a little more about what he thinks of the experience so far. I don't know that you said how long you guys have been doing it. Six months, maybe? Six months? Yeah. That's been super so, long. So you guys weathered the last uh, bump or weren't really affected by it? Because that would have been within the last six months, right? You mean um, the yeah. last bump as in the eastern region that had performance issues? Yes, performance issues. Yes, we we weathered that, but effectively for us it was outage. Um, we happened to, just so you know how Amazon's uh, set up is like each region has several availability zones. So they're basically separate data centers um, within a region and they're all supposed to be totally separate power and all that and so within a region you know your server resides on an availability zone but it's built so that there's a lot of redundancy across availability zones and um, in the eastern region of all the availability zones that there were I think there's four ours happened to be the one that had problems and we had one server on one availability zone um, and we haven't we've been working on a you know redundancy and fault tolerance and uh, that kind of kicked us into gear a little more um, to start working on that and then the approach of Hurricane Sandy uh, made us take that a little more seriously too. Um, so you've got several regions in the US and and those are pretty separate. I mean they're geographically separate um, but also infrastructure wise um, across Amazon they're they're pretty separate and there's uh, there's certain things you can do between regions but it's really limited what you can do between regions. It's really geared towards redundancy across uh, the availability zones. Um, so I'm, I'm kind of working through all that now to try to come up with our, our our best plan for redundancy. Now are you doing stuff with the elastic block storage or are you doing stuff on, are you using elastic block storage or <coughs> storage or are you using S3 or some combination or well, we're using the the EC2 is the server, you know, it, it's the virtual server, mm -hmm. um, and it uses the Elastic Block Storage, the EBS, for its backend data store, like the the primary drive and our secondary drive are both EBS volumes. Um, but we're using S3 actually to copy our backups and stuff. So. Um, like we've got backups that run and they're just database backups and some other file system backups and then I've got a task that runs regularly that actually copies those backups out to a different region actually out to the Oregon region um, so if a nuclear bomb hits um, Virginia then you know all of our all of our data and we've got another server over there that we can bring up in a short period of time um, and, and restore so um, and that's kind of our sh that's our short-term redundancy uh, hoping to automate that a little more and and in the long run actually have you know a hot backup running out in Oregon um, that but that actually is going to require a little more effort and that's not it's not automatic with uh, a lot of the Amazon stuff um, if you're going across availability zones in the same region, some of that stuff you can just set up right in the control panel, and you've got redundancy right there. Um, like if you're using their um, their uh, database solution, whether you're using MySQL or SQL Server, um, it can be redundant across two availability zones. So if one availability zone goes down, uh, your SQL Server, in theory, um, will be uninterrupted. Um, but what, one of the things you have to remember, though, is a lot of this tech is is amazing as the technology is that Amazon has put in place. Um, a lot of this stuff is still 
um, really under development. Um, in fact, the outage they had in the eastern region with the one availability zone uncovered several bugs in uh, their whole in their infrastructure. One of them being it was a lot of the um, databases did not automatically switch over uh, because certain timing issues. Um, so there, there's still. I mean, people need to realize that um, as much as they have out there, a lot of this stuff is still growing. It's it's still not, you know, just because you get on Amazon and because you use some of the availability stuff, um, you, you still don't have 100% uptime. You still got to put a lot of effort in yourself. Uh, but they do have a lot of tools to help you with it. And I think that's something that a lot of people think that, oh, I'm going to the cloud, so now it's just going to magically be available. Actually, I had to explain that to my bosses because they thought that. And said, you know, it doesn't quite work that way. You gotta still have to do things to make your applications redundant, like you're talking about. Yeah, yeah. You've got to do it at the, you know, at, your, at the system level, um, but you also have to do it at the application level. I mean, we, we, our application is not cloud enabled in the sense that um, we've got to rewrite certain things to allow them to take advantage of you know, some of the redundancy out there. Um, simple things that we can do is like right now our SQL Server is right on our server instance. We can easily switch to using, you know, an Amazon, uh, one of the hosted servers, you know, the database servers. Um, and there's, so, there's a lot of simple steps you can do, but there's a lot of steps that take <laughs> effort too. Um, especially if you want to do end up, you know, with a hot backup that needs to be, you know, kept up to date. There's there's a lot of sometimes your application code actually has to change in order to um, to allow that. Now, as far as cost goes, um, doing the co-location thing like you're doing in the two separate regions, did that basically double any sort of cost? Was it just a small increase, or how did how did something like how how was that how was that worked out? Well, for Amazon, you're charged only by usage. Um, so the way I've got it right now is our Oregon server is powered down most of the time. So um, we're paying for the allocation, the disk allocation, which is relatively cheap. Um, the big cost is really is CPU. Um, CPU hours. So as long as your server's up and running, that's where your biggest cost is. Uh, so if you have a hot backup or you have load balancing, um, then yeah, you're doubling your cost by bringing another server up. But if you want a, a cold backup that's powered off, it's actually really cheap um, to do that. So should we have a situation where our our primary zone goes down. Um, we would fire up the in the secondary zone. We do. We're using Route 53, their DNS, Amazon's DNS solution, which you have to use if you're going to go across regions. Um, they've got some nice stuff. Their Elastic IP, where you can switch the IP address to different servers, but they have to be within the same region across availability zones. You can't magically switch those IP addresses across um, regions, but you can use their Route 53 DNS um, to switch where things are pointing to um, across regions. I mean, it can, I mean, you can point stuff outside of Amazon with that, too. Um, when you did the, just out of curiosity, did you just assign like a subdomain, like www whatever company name dot com or did you have to give them top level domain well you've got to switch your name server for the top level domain over okay to to them because it's, it's got to be the name server you know Amazon has to be the name server in order for that to work properly I see now when you're doing the backups and backups and stuff like that do they also charge 
I'm guessing they probably also charge bandwidth costs between the regions. Yes. Um, you get charged for data transfer. You get charged for um, storage. So we get charged for however much disk space our, you know, our S3 buckets are taking up mm -hmm. <clears throat> that have the backups. Um, IOs within, you know, or data in, data out within a region is uh, pretty cheap. It, it's a little bit more across regions. Um, but, I mean, everything costs. Every little, th basically, you don't pay for a bundle. You pay for every little thing that you use. And, and most of the usage fees are pretty small, but the more you use, obviously, the more it adds make up. Their money. Yeah. Right. Well, and I think that's kind of what's impressive about the fact that Netflix uses them, right? Because Netflix is doing large transfers. Um, oh, yeah. So, it, but it, obviously, they've been doing it for years. So it must work out for them. I mean, they must have done the, the calculations. Um, Don't they still hold the title for, like, the largest, like, the largest gross internet bandwidth traffic used by any one particular entity? Probably. I believe so. I, because I, I think I remember at one point in time seeing that they were consuming like 20 or 25 percent of total internet traffic overall. I think it may have been larger than that, actually. The only thing that I can think of that might have touched them at any single point in time would have been the um, space jump that just happened, because that set all kinds of records. Yeah. But that was being spread. I mean, Google was getting help from Akamai and all kinds of people to try to get that to happen. So I'm not sure. Hmm. Yeah, but that was just a one-time thing, whereas Netflix is probably on a consistent basis every night, prime time. People are doing movies. Kids are watching sh cartoons and stuff off of there. So I'm sure Netflix is much more consistent than, um, than just a one-time jump. <laughs> well, especially since it, I don't, know how much you guys watch the show, but at our house we've got my wife and daughter will both be watching, like my daughter will be watching the right. latest Vampire Diaries and my wife is watching some Jane Eyre movie and <laughs> I, you know, I'll go to like download an ISO and go why is it so slow? Oh look, everybody's <laughs> using all the bandwidth to watch movies. <laughs> Yeah, and uh, here here at our house, we we although we do have multiple devices and can probably watch it on three or four different devices, um, probably five or six if you include phones. Um, we pretty much only do one at a time. I mean, but I do have Netflix set up on every video game system I have in the house on multiple TVs. <laughs> Jesus, I don't, I don't use Netflix. <laughs> yeah. I have Netflix on every TV. The Blu-ray players. Um, I have two Rokus. I also it's have pretty much on everything. Yeah, Greg, I don't use it either. Yeah, I, I don't. I, I, I'm still one of those weird people that buys discs. So, oh, I still buy discs too. It's just... like, I, like I buy discs for everything. DVDs, Blu-rays, I still buy music discs, all that jazz. Yeah. But, you know. I have almost a 500 DVD collection, so... I still yeah, buy this I, too. I just bought four, four more this weekend. So I think I'm up to almost a thousand now. So so I was uh, well, I've been irritated because Netflix keeps losing contracts. They need to fix that, or there isn't going to be anything left to watch the rate they're doing. Yeah, we've noticed that there are certain things that were on there before that we wanted to go back and Kim was mentioning that the other day, she wanted to go back and watch something and it was gone. She goes, I can't find it anymore. I'm like, yeah, that must've got yanked. So yeah, that is a little annoying. Oh, man. But you know what? For the price, it's still a damn good service Yeah. for as much as we use it. There's nothing that can really beat it as far as I'm concerned for the price. So next story. Let's move on down, and we'll do this as the last story, and we're going to push the own cloud, unless somebody wants to talk about the own cloud. That stuff. We'll I was kind of surprised cloud. you would put that in time. there. Um, I may kill it. It may never show up again, but hopefully we'll talk about it next week. I have actually done some research on it, so I, sh I would like to talk about it, but let's just skip to Mega Upload, because I can't miss Mega Upload. If you've 
since we're talking about cloud and, and storage and redundancy, um, mega upload should be a different type of tail, one where you go, hmm, yeah, probably shouldn't have put the corporate data on a site that was also hosting lots of stolen stuff. <laughs> um, <laughs> Whoever, who does that, Brian? I don't know. <laughs> Obviously, a lot of companies, because there were a lot of people really upset when they confiscated those servers. So um, I didn't see where he said specifically what he was doing this time, but Kim.com is back in the news because he's going to open up a new service called me.ga for Mega. And uh, he has a plan to fool law enforcement, which probably isn't really going to fool them as much as he's going to put his stuff where they can't touch him. And he's going to open it on January 20th in 2013, which happens to be the one-year anniversary of the day he was pseudo-arrested and all of his servers were taken offline. So, um, he's going to okay, do so what is really cool stuff. Do you know what the .ga is for? No, and I forgot to look it up. I meant to. It is Gabon. The Gabon. registry is Gabon Telecom. Where's Gabon? Gabon, G-A-B-O-N. Hmm. wonder if that's where he's storing his servers, too. <laughs> <laughs> you just have to find a country that's not friendly with the West. Well, it sounds like he, it's not just going to be a few servers. It sounds like he's going to have everyone contribute that's a non-U.S. location. He said he wants to have a massive global network. All non-U.S. hosters will be able to connect servers and bandwidth. It's right. a sovereign state on the west coast of Central Africa. Uh. That's great. So he's so let let's hope that data center, if that's where he picks it, isn't actually by the water. <laughs> <laughs> From everything we've just talked about, hopefully he listens to our podcast yeah. and learns yeah. Yeah. not to put his servers near the damn water. <laughs> There's an ocean right next to you. Don't put that there. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, yeah. Let's just hope he does that. Sure. Or he could be like the guys from. Um, I don't know if everybody saw the stories about the Pirate Bay, who's now put everything basically into memory on the servers that they have. So all the tracking files for all the torrents are now in memory. So if the government goes in and takes the servers, if they shut the servers off, they've lost everything because there was nothing ever written to disk. That's awesome. Yep. That's awesome. And there's only like four router servers that route between those that actually know where all the servers are and actually have any data on them at all. And they've designed it such that they can bring up new ones and take, take ones down at will. And again, everything is just stored in memory for, for the servers. And it all happens within minutes and hours versus days. They can have everything back up. Good on them. Yeah. <laughs> so all your torrents should be good to go. Now, Brian, for the uh, Mega Upload, or the new Mega, did you see that they're trying to ready developers for their new Mega API? And they're going to do more than just normal uh, torrent sharing. They're looking to get into, what, the VoIP, fax tools, video apps, email, you name it, he wants to provide it. Yeah. I mean, and why shouldn't he? He's going to have a whole bunch of servers who, for the most part, are just storing data, so they got plenty of bandwidth. I mean, plenty of CPU time. And he'll have plenty of bandwidth. Um, well, he'll try to have plenty of bandwidth. It depends on where he puts himself. Um, yeah, it it's possible. It's he's doing a lot more stuff with security this time. He learned his lesson. And he's making sure everything is encrypted this time. So, yes, and he said you can encrypt on the fly, all for free. Did you guys see the servers that he's looking for? <clears throat> twenty terabytes of disk space, twenty terabytes of disk space, four gig of RAM, at least one gigabyte, uh, one gigabit a second uplink, two gigabits preferred, and he wants sixty of them. Wow. That's huge. <laughs> that well, will be I mean, mega. 
M E dot G A. The only thing I'm wondering about is is you're gonna have twenty terabytes of disk space but only four gigs of RAM. And a one gigabit per second uplink means it's gonna take a long time to fill that twenty terabytes. But well, two gigabits preferred. Okay, but still <laughs> Brian, he planned that? Don't worry about it. <laughs> it's gonna be by an ocean. Just you know <laughs> if it's crap I was it's crap. I don't know. I don't know enough about Gabon. I'm, I'm just wondering if there's a, a local warlord that he's got to make sure he pays homage to. to <laughs> keep the pirates out of his uh, mega .ga location. He's probably got auto turrets set up around the data center or something. I mean, yeah, it's still the upload thing because I've got a customer right now that's got a whopping three megabit per second band or bonded T1 that they're uh, backing up. 300 gigabytes to a cloud service on and it's at like 200 hours and still hasn't finished uploading. I remember when T1 used to be cool. Yeah. Well, they were trying to convince me that cable wouldn't be faster for them and I was like, yeah. <laughs> Cable's not only faster but probably a tenth of the price. Yeah, show me the proof and then <laughs> yeah, we'll go yeah. from there. Yeah. That's okay. Somebody else was told that uh, partial T1 would be faster than a 6 megabit DSL. And I was like, oh, right. not on any planet I know of. <laughs> yeah, really. <laughs> but, right. Like, I, I understand, at least I think I understand what they were trying to say, because you're not dedicated bandwidth on a DSL, but you're really not shared bandwidth either. It's, it's yeah. Alright, Brian, I think Mike has to take off. Oh, all right. We'll let him go. He is the special guest, after all. <laughs> oh, he's gone. Wow, that was quick. He didn't wow. Say bye. That's because you don't pay attention to chat, Brian. I was. Kind of helps when you pay attention to the whole podcast, just not yourself. <laughs> <laughs> Brian's in Brian's space right now. He doesn't, you know, wow. there's, there's a bubble. Let's there's other things happening Corey. besides. There's other the things lake. happening. That there's other things happening besides you talking, Brian. <laughs> I see. All right. What else are well, we talking yeah, about yeah, tonight? Yeah. This is going to be one of our longest podcasts in quite a while. Yeah. By my. Well, no, you missed, you missed this. last week's. You missed last week's. Last week's was pretty darn long. <laughs> yeah, we, oh, we kind of just rambled and rambled and rambled about nothing. That's what happens when you leave Greg and I alone, and it's just the two of us to do a podcast. We just keep talking. Let's see. I think I got, what, five minutes of that one? Yeah. Five yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, anyways, I really think we're done. I don't know if there's anything else that we want to talk about. Yeah, I kind of agree. It's going twice. I, I think we should talk about more Windows 8. And we're done! <laughs> <laughs> Where's that mute button? Hey, there you go. Mute him. And we'll mute him. And we'll mute him. There you go. Now I'm the only one that can talk. Ha ha. Anyways, if you have any recommendations for people for us to interview, please feel free to email us at podcastlinuxinstall.net. If you'd like to complain about the fact that everybody that I muted everybody. Wait, I'm muted. I don't think you've muted everybody. No, I can talk. I can talk too. I can unmute myself, Brian. Yes, I can unmute myself that, as well. Really, that doesn't ha, mean ha, ha. <laughs> Touche. <laughs> Touche. <laughs> what the hell? <laughs> <laughs> All right, so that's a big game of whack-a-ball. Well, you guys can Can you turn your cameras back on? I don't know. Anyways, the cameraman app is really useless then if I can't mute you. So, if you want to follow us, we have a Facebook page, of course, it's linuxinstall.net, or facebook.com slash linuxinstall.net. You can follow us on Twitter and Identica, we are Linux Install on both of those. Of course, you and can it follow is, us... And it is Linux Install, not Windows Install. Yeah, it is Linux Install. <laughs> on Google+, Plus, our Google Plus page is now plus.google.com slash linuxinstall.net, believe it or not. And you can also look for us and comment wherever you find fine podcasts like ours. Okay, well, maybe not this one, but most of them are fine. Um, on iTunes, Odeo, and our good friends over at Stitcher. And I think that does it. So, Corey, since you were late, what should everybody go do? They should go out and install some Linux. Have a nice week, everybody. We'll see you.
Windows 8. Right. <laughs> <laughs>